morning, everybody. Welcome. It's so good to see you guys. Looking good? Glad you're here. Thanks for coming. Welcome to all of you who are watching online, wherever you're watching from. We're glad to have you with us. Thank you so much for being with us. Hey, uh, this past week, um, our team that was in South Africa got back. And uh, yeah, yeah, give them a hand. And man, from all accounts, it was an incredible, incredible trip. And uh, there was 13 people on the team, and they did all kind of service projects and invested in people and uh, did uh, feeding programs and different things. One of the really cool things they did was a day of royalty where they uh, had about over 220 kids uh, from really... Uh, really impoverished neighborhood, at-risk kids who came in. They just loved on them, served them, fed them, gave them gifts and all kinds of cool things. And so we've got a little video to give you a little window of uh, how that trip went. So just uh, watch this real quick and check it out. Because this is Africa. This time for Africa. My favorite parts of dance moves, but uh, <laughs> but what's really great about these trips is those guys went and they served and they made a difference in a lot of those kids' lives and different adults as well. But uh, the other thing about it is everybody on that trip got deeply impacted and their life was changed. It's why we call short-term missions discipleship on steroids, because those guys grew more in a week and they're going to grow two years sitting around here. And so next time there's a trip, man, if you want to grow, you want to move forward, you want to step out of your comfort zone, I just encourage you to consider doing that and being a part of that. It will make a difference in your life and you'll get to make a difference in other people's lives at the same time. So we're going to talk a little message here today, and then we're going to do communion here in a few minutes, but I'm going to take a few minutes to set that up. Uh, we've been in a series called The Greatest Story Ever Told, and man, it's been great. Jill Carter did a fast, fantastic job last week, and Jake, yeah, yeah, Jake did one of the best messages I've ever heard on the prodigal son a few weeks ago, and so it's just really, really good. Now you got to listen to me. But uh, today we're going to do a message called The Last Supper. And uh, this is just where Jesus was at the very end of his life, and he was about to have this meal with his disciples, and he, and he sits down to have the meal, and, and John's version of it in John 13, uh, John says that, that Jesus uh, sits everybody down at this upper room, and he calls all his, his key people together, and it says that Jesus took a towel and a basin and he went around and washed all of the disciples' feet. And, uh, and, and, you know, of course, when he got to Peter, Peter had to say something, of course, because that's what Peter did. And Peter's like, no, Lord, you shouldn't wash my feet. You're my teacher and my Lord. And, and, uh, <laughs> and Jesus is like, well, Peter, if you don't let me wash your feet, you don't understand who I really am and what this is all about. And, of course, Peter overreacts and basically says, well, wash all of me then. And the Keith Spurgeon version of what Jesus then said is, well, Peter, I'm not really into that, but I'm going to wash your feet, okay? And, uh, and so he washes his feet, and he does this thing. And then he sits down, 
And, uh, and he says, you know, you've called me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, but think about what I just did. And I want you to go and do likewise. I want you to go and make your life about others and serving others, not just about yourself. And you know, just a few days before that, Jesus had come into the city on the first Palm Sunday, which is what we celebrate today. It was the first Sunday when Jesus came into Jerusalem, and there's hundreds of thousands of visitors in the city because the Passover celebration was happening. And all these people began to hear that Jesus was coming in the town. They began to gather. And so there's hundreds of thousands of people gathered to see Jesus come marching in as the conquering king, as most conquering kings would come in on a giant horse and an entourage, and they would have guards and trumpets and horns and all the things. And Jesus comes riding in on a donkey's colt. Because he wasn't coming as a conquering king, he was coming as a suffering servant to lay down his life for every single one of us. And then he had that that dinner that night with his disciples, and and they they broke bread together and, and shared it. And I want to pick up the story in Matthew chapter 26 of that meal So let's go ahead and put that on the screen. And here's what it says. This is Matthew's version of what happened. He says, while they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now and on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, where Jesus would be betrayed by his good friend Judas, who would then hand him over to the authorities. He'd be tried in a kangaroo court, accused of all kinds of things that he didn't do, and he wouldn't speak a word in response or to defend himself. And he goes to the cross, having been tortured and beaten. And he hangs on that cross, taking all of our sin and our shame and our pain and our past and our regrets onto himself. Spreading his arms wide on that cross, giving us that forever picture that God loves you and me this much. And then he died on that first Good Friday. And on that first Easter Sunday morning, which we will celebrate next Sunday, he rose from the dead to reveal to all of us and to make sure we all know that he really was who he said he was. And he gives us that freedom and that honor today. Today, we're going we're gonna to celebrate that last supper that he had with his disciples and be reminded of what that really means and why it's so significant and why this week it literally, this week represents the most important week in the history of the world. So let's pray, and we'll talk about it. Father, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for Jesus, who gave his life for us, who did for us what we could not do for ourselves. He came and lived a perfect life, and then took all of our sin and our shame and our pain and our past and our regrets onto himself so that we could live free free to be who you've called us to be, free to become more like you, free to make our lives not just about ourselves, but about others as well. And God, I pray that today, as we engage this communion time, that you would meet with us in a unique way, very personally. And God, I pray for any of us who don't know you, that we would come to know you. And God, for those of us who do know you, you, may we come closer to you today as we remember what you've done for us. In Jesus' strong, life-changing name, amen. So I want to give you three thoughts about communion. And, and we, we take communion really seriously around here. We don't do it every week because we don't want it to become rote and just habit and just doesn't start to not mean anything. We do it about quarterly is when we aim for to do it quarterly so that it actually means something to us and we understand what it is. And every time we do it, we want to explain it so that we're not just going through the motions because when we understand what it means and what it's about, it takes on new 
purpose and life their lives. So that's, that's why we do it the way we do it. And so the first thing I want to say about communion is that communion is a simple celebration. It's a simple celebration. It's a cel- In fact, the word communion, you could also use Lord's Supper or the Eucharist if you're from more of a liturgical background. The word Eucharist actually means celebration. It's a celebration that God did for us what we could not do for ourselves. And if you look at Matthew 26, verse 6, let's put that verse up. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. It's a simple celebration. You know, there's nothing more simple than bread, is there? Like bread is like as simple as it gets, right? I mean, I've been in places in the world where people hardly had anything to eat, but they all had bread. I think that's why Jesus said that he was the bread of life, because for many people, it's the sustenance of life. And, and bread is just this, it's just this simple, simple thing. And it kind of reminds me, uh, holding this, it reminds me, uh, some of my kids, some of my adult kids, uh, they, they were trying out a new church recently in their town. And, uh, and <laughs> they, I talked to them a few days later, and they were like, Dad, it was really weird. <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? Well, they had communion that day. And the pastor was talking about communion, and all, the whole time during the, the message, he's holding this piece of bread, and he's just manhandling this bread. <laughs> and he's like, holding this bread, and then he says, now we're going to take and eat. And he gave us that bread that he even man. I was like, I don't want that. I was, uh. So today, this is what you're getting. No, <laughs> I'm just, just kidding. You're not getting it. <laughs> but it's simple, right? It's simple, it's simple. And it's a simple reminder of what Jesus did for us. And the more that we wrap our hearts and minds around how much we need to be forgiven in our lives, the more communion means to our lives. And a lot of times you think, well, it's just a thing, or or, I'm I'm a pretty good person. A lot of people say that in our culture. I'm a pretty good person, you know. I don't smoke, drink, chew, or go with girls that do much. And, uh, and, you know, I don't, I haven't murdered anybody or dealt drugs in a long time. Long, you know, I'm a pretty good person, you know. And it's kind of, that's, that's kind of how we view it. And the reality is that we all screw it up, don't we? Can I get an amen on that? Amen. We all make mistakes. We all say things we wish we hadn't said. We all hurt people, sometimes on purpose and sometimes accidentally. And we all, we all in our lives at times, choose to go our way rather than going God's way, which is the definition of sin. God says, hey, I want you to go this way. And we're like, thank you very much. I'm going to go this way. And we have all done that. We've all made mistakes. We've all messed it up. And we all desperately need forgiveness in our lives, which is why Jesus came, guys, because we need him so much. We all are desperately in need of a savior. And at communion, we celebrate that he's done that in our lives and he's given us that. And it's beautiful, it's powerful, and, as, and it's just a reminder of how much in need of him we are. Number two, communion is a statement of faith. Communion is a statement of our faith. And, and the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, speaking of this, he said, for every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. So every time you take communion, you're saying, hey, I'm in. I believe this. I believe that Jesus really did this for me, and, I, and I'm depending on him for this, and I'm reaffirming my faith in God and who he is and what he's done for me. You know, in, in our world, there's a lot of, it's, it feels like everything's changing all the time, Right? It feels like everything's constantly changing and in motion, and you, you can't get your feet established on anything. But this faith that we proclaim today as we take communion, this faith has been solid rock for over 2,000 years. It has not changed. This faith in Jesus as our Savior and as the one who has given his life for us has stood the test of time. It has stood up and stood the test in the face of all kinds of wars and philosophies and political parties and all kinds of issues and the worst that humanity could bring to the table. And yet, this faith stands true. It has outlasted governments and dictators and all kinds of countries and nations. It has been around way longer than this nation ever has been. It has 
Christ stood the test time, and we declare that faith today as we take communion. In fact, I'd like to do something today. Uh, we're not really super liturgical around here, but I love to do this when we take communion, is to uh, say the Apostles' Creed together. And so uh, if we could put that on the screen, I'm just going to read through it real quick so we know what we're doing. But It says, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Worldwide Church. I use worldwide there. The original says Catholic, but people get tripped up on that. But Catholic just means universal or worldwide. So the Holy Worldwide Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now, guys, these creeds, like the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, they were developed in the fourth century because the church was all over the place. I mean, people, some people believe this, some people believe that. Nobody was sure what they believed. And, and a group of leaders in the church got together and they said, we can at least agree on this. <laughs> We may not agree on our politics. We probably don't. I know that's true around here for sure. We don't agree on our politics. We don't agree on, on this or that or that thing or this other thing. But these things right here, this is what it means to be orthodox. This is what it means to come together as the people of God and say, we believe this. There may be a lot of things we don't agree about, but we agree on this. There's something powerful when we do that together as the family of God. So I, if you're able, I'd like you to stand as we say this creed together today. And we're going to try to say it together. We're not very liturgical, so we don't do very good at this sometimes, but we're going to do our best, all right? So uh, let, just, just follow along with me and say it out loud with me, okay? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Worldwide Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You can be seated. Great job, everybody. That was beautiful. There's something so powerful when we come together and we say, yeah, we agree on this. There's something unifying and beautiful about that as we do that. The last thing I want to say about this is communion is a moment to remember. It's a moment to remember. Again, the Apostle Paul says, speaking of that, and when he had given thanks, being Jesus, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So it, it's a time, it's a moment, it's a holy moment, by the way. Holy means set apart. It's a set apart moment to remember what Jesus did for every single one of us. So I'd like us to bow our heads for a moment and just close your eyes. And the reason we I encourage you to close your eyes is because this is between you and God. And we don't want to be distracted by anybody else. So Father, we come before you right now as your people online, here in the room, we ju we're just here with you. And God, we, we just want to say, we love you. We're so thankful for what Jesus did for us. We're so thankful that he laid his life down so that we could be free. I just encourage you to make this really, really personal. In your own heart and mind, God made you, you can hear you. Just tell him, Jesus, thank you so much for dying for me. Thank you so much for forgiving me. Thank you for giving your life for me. And today, if you mean it, say this in your own heart and mind. And today, I give my life back to you. Father, I pray as we celebrate communion, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist today, that we would remember what you've done for us. And we would celebrate your goodness in our lives.
We ask all this in the strong, life-changing name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So uh, we have tables at the front and the back. If you've never been with us before for communion, it's an intimate time. Uh, we're going to have table hosts at every table, so if you hosts would come to your table, that would be great. Uh, the ushers are going to release you by aisle to come and take communion. And the people who are hosting those tables, you'll have an opportunity for them to pray for you. If you don't want them to pray for you, you can just kind of wave and go, no thanks, and uh, you can move on. It's okay. But we'd love to pray for you. Um, if, you're, if you're not a follower of Jesus and you don't want to take communion today, you're free to sit in your seat or to just walk up with everybody and turn and go back. You're welcome and wanted here no matter where you're at in the, on this journey. Uh, we love you, and I hope you'll enjoy this time and just let it be a time. This is a sacred, holy moment, a set-apart time with you and Jesus. All right, ushers, go ahead and release people by their aisles, and we'll move forward here.